Tabelo, good afternoon. Good afternoon, say how are you? Welcome in Mauritius. Thank you. First time? No, not first time actually. I was, um, my first time here was last year in 2023 in May for the same um, series of um, seminars that we have now and also for the same anniversary to anniversary. Yeah, so it's not the first Happy time. Happy to be back? Um, actually, I'm, I'll be here for, for a while. I've recently just got my residence permit, so I'll be here for the whole of the year. So definitely, if I leave, I'll be back, of course. <laughs> so what is the Tutua Consulting Group? Tutua Consulting Group um, is a boutique firm that um, looks um, at uh, advising our clients, from a variety of range of clients, starting from governments, civil society, organizations. We also look at um, regional institutions where we look at issues related to the political economy um, and recently we've just kind of widened our horizon to also look at issues around uh, digital transformation. We also look at um, issues around the regulation and application of um, emerging technologies as you also seen. We also do training on around all the issues that I mean the, the, the topics that we also give advisory services on to a varied range of clients. Yes. So you're, you're South African. How do you see the, the economic and regional uh, community in Mauritius? Um, Quite different. So, so for me, for me, um, I am Zimbabwean, South African, mm -hmm. and Mauritian. So that's yes. really a uh, good coverage for me to really have a kind of um, a view of um, the regional economic situation. So I think there's uh, a lot of um, diversity, if you check, from the difference between South Africa and Zimbabwe, and then the difference between South Africa and Mauritius, and also the difference between all the three of the countries that you see that I've lived in. Uh, Mauritius, I think I've been here for a couple of months now this year, and that my first time here coming was last year, and I saw a lot of um, developments that were still just beginning, They're still at the beginning stage, but now I see that there's it looks like it's a it's a fast growing economy so in terms of infrastructure development that i can say in mauritius and i think compared to what you would see in other countries within the region i think i would say mauritius is one of the fastest growing in terms of development infrastructure which is actually one of the issues that we look at like in our coverages to to our, in our advisor services also you know in our in our webinars seminars and and, and training programs that we also conduct what are the questions that, that you have from your customers, clients, asking for some, some advice? Because Mauritius is a very small market. Yes. You see it, it's a small country, small yes. market. Yes. But I think they have difficulties to go on the African market. Maybe South Africa is the number one importer now of mm. motion products. And it seems that going a bit higher on the African continent, we are facing some some problems. Do you have this type of question? Help me. How to go in uh, South Africa? How to go in uh, Zimbabwe? Maybe mm. Kenya? Maybe Tanzania? Mm. Yeah, we, we we get we get a lot of uh, those questions because I mean, like you said, um, South Africa is more like the economic hub of uh, of Africa, particularly if you look at Africa from the southern uh, part of, of 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 the region. South Africa is is, is the economic hub. And now you have Mauritius, which is also in the same, you know, Static region. The yeah, it's the Static, yeah, and also being a fast-growing economy as well. So I think that you 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 will get a lot of um, clients also coming to you, looking to enter those markets because they seem to present a lot of the opportunities that they're looking for. Because um, you know, you, you you look at it from a regulator, and 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 also a policy policy kind of policy environment perspective. You look at um, the tax regimes as well. I think most of the country, most of the clients will be coming to us looking to invest here. Will be looking at the f a favorable tax regime, like, and then on top of that, you also have that coupled with um, the legal and policy environment, the regulatory policy environment. So we get that, yeah, of course, from our clients looking at both the two markets, Mauritius and South Africa. We know that uh, Mauritius and South Africa, we are here, we are. So we are in Comesa, we are in SADEC, we are mm. in African Union, we are mm. in other cities. Seems that everything is going, each group is doing his thing. Is it time for us to 
to do one only one one Africa, one tariff, one custom duties, and one connectivity also mm -hmm. is a, is another question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really a very interesting question because um, in our um, in our work we also look at that regional integration and we look at the various um, regional economic communities that we have and memberships to all these various in, in regional economic communities that we have and also look at the interlinkages and between you know the the RECs themselves which are the regional economic communities and you see that membership in those actually is more like intertwined where you have Mauritius being a member of the SADC and also being a member of COMESA. You will also have some countries who are member of, members of COMESA, also member of the EAC, East African Community, and IGAD. Right. So that really kind of complicates the integration agenda that we have in Africa. But then we have the African Continental Free Trade Area, the FCFTA, which seeks to um, unify all these um, fragmented you know, efforts towards integrating Africa um, uh, regionally. And then we hope, we just hope, we hope that, um, you know, with implementation, continuous implementation, the FCFTA is actually going to achieve that goal of achieving the integration of Africa. Yes. Tabelo, coming back to, to today. Yes. So it's your second anniversary. Yes. Are you happy? I'm, I'm very excited, actually. Uh, it uh, shows the growth of Tutwa as a brand and showing um, that we are not we are not, we, we, when we say we are actually African driven, that's what we mean. It just shows that we are willing to knock all those doors in Africa and say, okay, we want to be present. We want to be present across Africa. We want to be present in all the initiatives that are actually being undertaken under Africa together with um, all the various member states in integrating the continent. So I'm very excited that Tutwa is turning as uh, celebrating its second anniversary here in Mauritius, which is really one of um, the greatest achievements uh, being a women-led uh, you know firm in Africa and also you know expanding beyond you know the borders of South Africa but also going into other growing markets like Mauritius yes so you just opened a center for excellence with yes yes indeed yes. and then we are going back to to your colleague Tabelo thank you very much Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Kira, just talked to Tabelo about uh, the presence of Tutua Consulting Group in Mauritius. So it's a big day for you. It's the launch of the Center for Excellence. What is the purpose of it? So a couple of years ago, the Tutua was doing a piece of research around the African continental free trade area, the implications of that, of that protocol. And the, the, the research specifically focused on e-commerce, digital trade, uh, issues of digital transformation, uh, fintech, emerging technologies. So whilst we were doing the research, we realized that this domain of trade, investment, and digital transformation is emerging, it's new, but it's also become the catalyst for growth across for countries and, and across countries in Africa. And we thought there was a need, we saw the need to formalize that knowledge into some kind of uh, program that, you know, that knowledge exchange can, could take place. And so we conceived this, this, this program on, called Professional Practice and Leadership in Trade, Investment and Digital Transformation. It was done, uh, it was done about a year ago, and then we had it accredited at the MQA, Mauritius Qualifications Authority, and then due to some uh, logistical issues and other factors, it didn't run in 2023. So we launched it today with six students. It was very successful. And I think in hindsight, that delay was probably good because it let us think more deeply about this domain. And what we realize is that one program doesn't capture all of the knowledge that exists within this domain. And so we've come up with this concept of the, of the center of excellence. And the Center of Excellence has quite a few pillars to it. And the one pillar is an academy where we say, let's look at all of the training that needs to emerge from this. And we've come up with four programs that we think can be run uh, that, that collectively gives you a broad knowledge of or deep knowledge of this domain. And there, are, and there are smaller courses that run in between. So that's the academy. And then we've got a research portal. We've done a lot of research, a lot of peer-reviewed research that is very, very useful. 
And we want to give researchers an opportunity to publish their research, to engage with other researchers, and basically to build that research knowledge in, 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 in Africa. And so the research portal, and we want to try and do this by two things, an annual conference on trade investment and digital transformation with some key stakeholders, and also a peer-reviewed journal. So you can publish directly onto the website, or you can publish onto a peer-reviewed journal with an editorial board and all of that. So is this an opportunity for young researchers to start engaging? Uh, and then we're looking at a knowledge portal. And a knowledge portal is, you know, if you look into any domain nowadays, you see thousands and thousands of documents. It's very hard for people to find those documents. So we said, let's, let us curate those documents for you. Let us bring it all together. We put it onto a knowledge portal. We classify it. We categorize it. And we built a little AI engine that you can interrogate it. So you can go in using this AI engine, and you can ask it a particular topic, and it will then look to all of these thousands of documents and tell you where to find this information. So we think it's, it's, you know, it's easy, makes it easier for researchers. And then the last thing is to then have the, the, the advisory services, because it is a business after all. The rest of it is all kind of what we want to, we say it's, it's, just, it's a no cost. When we talk about fintech, digital economy, it's a big guy's environment. It's not a normal person like me is going to, to go to, to your academy. What type of persons of qualifications that you're targeting to, to run, to, to go to your academy, let's say your academy? The, the type of people we're targeting? Mm, yes. Yep. You see, the FinTech is a very good example, actually. There are just thousands of FinTechs emerging, right? And they sit outside of the traditional banking sector, and they are doing things that are outside of the regulatory impact, uh, of the regulatory regime currently. So we want to bring policymakers on board, because they need to understand this domain. Policy making can't take place like the way it used to. You can't have five years worth of policy making anymore. Policy making needs to be nimble, it needs to be quick, it needs to be flexible. But, but, but policy makers need to understand the domain. So one of our key stakeholders or targets are policy makers, regulators, senior government officials, public servants uh, to come onto our program. We want to build this cadre of knowledgeable people across Africa so that when they implement policy and they implement regulations, it's done with a sense of knowledge of the domain. This is a very fast-moving domain. Yes, we, uh, oh, we know that uh, FinTech is, uh, is growing, but for the normal person, sure. something that is done not five years, we were talking about Bitcoin, we went to crypto, mm. we, are, we, mm. are, we have talked about something that nobody has been able to understand, which is blockchain. Yeah, yeah. Now we are, in a, we are on... A, we are using this technology with, uh, with banks. Banks are using Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Oh, there are numerous banks in Mauritius. So I'm yeah. not going yeah. to, to name them. But we are using, but we don't think that we are using. How are you going to help the Mauritian community, these women that you, you met today, to adapt these technologies of cashless payment, sure. automatic sure. something? Sure. How are you doing to uh, sure. help, help them? So when you look at Training and awareness is almost like a triangle like Maslow. You know the Maslow triangle yeah, yeah, of yeah. hierarchy of needs. And at the bottom end of the training is where you empower citizens to use something safely. Uh, they must have trust, else the system doesn't work. And so at the bottom end, I think it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more around awareness and training. Right? So a lower, a lower level of skills, but more broadly targeted. Right? As you go up, it'll be the people you met today. You know, senior managers in organizations that need to understand the implications of the decisions they make. And as you go to the top end of the, uh, of the, of the pyramid, you're looking at people who create IP and technology and innovation and research papers that are at a national level that's important. So that's the kind of thing we want to do. So we're also building in that bottom layer that says, Here's awareness for how you understand, how you start engaging with these technologies. In that triangle, my triangle is there's technology, there's customer, there is the merchant. Sure, sure. Sometimes the trust 
is not between the, <laughs> the, the customer and the merchant. Yeah. The merchant wants to have his money very quick, yeah. with less paper, with less administrative costs, sure. and the customer don't want to have his name, his credit card on the, the merchant uh, paying device. Yeah. So at the end, it's the, the IP guy there on the top sure. who has to manage all these problems. Yep. So if you look at if you look at e-commerce, for example, uh, you can have the best solutions, or even government services, right? So government rolls out services and they great services, but unless people have the confidence to trade or to interact with government online, those services fall apart. So it's a demand side issue and it's a supply side issue. So we think the supply side issue is probably easier because you've got the fintech and the government rolling out the services. It's the demand for the services that we need to foster. There's always a natural tension between, there's two natural tensions, right? Supplier, a retailer and a customer, a natural tension. And regulator, government and innovators, yes. there's a natural tension. And we need to then empower people to, to meet in the middle. There needs to be a meeting of the minds and that, and, uh, and that only occurs with knowledge of how these things. The problem is regulation always follows innovation. Yes. Right? But we've got to make that gap, that following shorter. And right? That we, and that we, can't, we can tell COVID did something to, to that or all that eco ecosystem that sure. you were at your house, you, you could not move. You had the retailer who had his product, he has it had to, to be sold. Sure. And then so there was a synthesis in motion that we were going cashless. You send your car. Absolutely. We, we have many models that, that came out. Yeah. And then maybe COVID helped also the, the African community, the, as well as the motion community, to take that step that was, uh, let's say, it was a war before because sure. the bank said, I remember a certain time, don't go e commerce, it's not secure. The, your card can be hacked, you can be so, so. And then with COVID, I did not hear anything about it because the secure nature of the transaction was there. We, we had to, to give confidence to, to the system and to the merchant. Yeah, it, it, it was necessity, right? You know, over, over human history, you see there are pivotal points in history where the change is so exponential. Right? And COVID may have been one of those. It fast forwarded things that may have taken five years. You know, Lenin, the, 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 the philosopher said, for there are decades that nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. So, you know, decades of change can happen in a week. And that COVID was probably that kind of thing. So the trick now is to make that exponential change happen quicker because the technology and the advancements, this is the fastest stage of human innovation ever and it's not slowing down right so i'm a tech guy right and i wake up sometimes confused every day to see the advances right so and i've got to read just to keep just to keep abreast and chat gpt may be a good example of that yeah. so the trick then is this flexibility and to bring this training on board as and when it's needed and in a way that's uh, accessible uh, and does not take uh, uh, the length of time that we used to. You know, I work in a traditional university and there's lots of hoops you have to jump through, right? And I'm not saying that we, we circumvent that, but I'm saying there must be a way that we do the same due diligence, but we just do it quicker. You talk about uh, chat GPT. And let's dream a bit. Is there a possibility that um, AI, artificial intelligence, I know it's in the fintech, becomes a, a danger? So, so there's different levels of danger, right? I mean, in every, in every industrial revolution that we've had, there's been a loss of jobs, there's been a new, new whole set of new jobs. So when people talk about danger, they talk about loss of jobs. But the debate has shifted where people are saying it could be a threat to humanity, Pity. right? Yeah. So there was a couple of uh, Senate hearings in the US 
uh, a month, a couple of months ago, where all the AI leaders were there. And they managed to shift the debate to whether AI is going to be an existential threat, whether it's going to be a threat to human beings, right? Whether it'll, it'll, the existence of human beings will be threatened by AI. I think that's the wrong debate. I think they were very clever to shift the debate there. The debate should be how they start regulating it, uh, when we regulate, how we regulate, and whether we don't create too much of regulation. So for, 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 for ChatGPT, for me, is a great tool. Right? And as my colleague Professor Maraj says, a tool makes a person who's good very good. A tool like ChatGPT can make a person who's bad very bad. Right? So, yeah, yeah. so we need to be very careful about how we do it. But I don't think it's a threat to humanity in itself. I think it's a threat to how we're going to coexist with technology. This technology and human beings, we call it a social technical system. We influence technology, technology influences us. So that's the dichotomy, that's the, the relationship we have with technology. I'll give you an example. All the social media platforms, they were great, right? They connected people. But nobody foresaw that they would also become platforms where abuse of women, misogyny and all that took place. So there's unexpected, there's unintended consequences of technology. And you know, it's known as unknown unknowns. You know, you don't really know what's going to happen. And that's the trick. And you've got to give the people the skill, the regulators and the policymakers the skill to react quickly to those. Because you don't know what's coming down the track. Down the track. So my question is, what is going to, to happen? We had AI, we had ChatGPT. Maybe AI started in, in, the, in the Second World. Sure. Because the, the, the American wanted to, to crack the famous uh, Enigma, a, Enigma a German, German code. It German started code. there. Yeah. And then started yeah. the computer in yeah. IBM and uh, whatsoever. Yeah. So we are victim of our well doing success. Well -doing success. <laughs> so where are we going now? Jean-Claude, it's a question that I don't think anybody can answer. But I think what we do expect is, you know, I was talking about human history where there's pivotal moments. This seems to be the pivotal moment for AI, right? Where it's going, I'm not sure, but I do know that uh, it's going to have an impact in society. We're already looking at medical solutions that we would not have cracked in the same amount of time that AI is helping us to do it, right? So this is certainly one side of the coin. We are looking at implications for work that's negative to a large extent. There's the other side of the coin. Again, we need to strike the balance. The problem is, there are 400 million people using ChatGPT. There's 8 billion people in the world. Are we creating another digital divide where the people, the haves and the have-nots, or the ability to use and the ability not to use? So that's another you know, dimension. We already have many digital divides, urban, rural, women, you know, those kinds of divides. So this disparity in use is, needs to be addressed. I don't know if you know the motion market. Are we ready for, for all this? I know the. The big tech are already, every day we are facing these cha challenges because now we've got into virtual assets, mm, all, mm, all, mm, all mm, these mm, things. Mm. Are the normal motion people ready for that? So, you have a population about 1.3 million, right? Very high levels of uh, education, right? Like 90% literacy rates and things like that. And that's the basis. That's a good basis for understanding, right? You are also, I saw an article the other day, over 700,000 cars, so very kind of, uh, you know, with a higher GDP that you've experienced, growth that you've experienced, you've got this, expo this, this impact on society. So certainly, I think a smaller population, well-educated, digitally savvy, dig digital skills, better prepared to handle the changes than, say, a society with large, amounts of digital people that are digitally illiterate. So if you look at an example of Estonia, three million people, one of the most online populations in the world, everything from cradle to grave, everything's online. So I think the smaller population is your advantage, the high skills is your advantage, a forward thinking government policies is your, is your advantage, and you're gonna have to start using that. Uh, you're in a small island state, uh, you're, you're water stressed, 
so the AI is going to have to come in with those kind of solutions, right? So from, again, losing that, that, that Maslow, I think the citizenry will probably be ready uh, for the acceptance of these changes and, and, and your government needs to then implement these policies to fast track. La last question. How do you see your center of excellence? Coming back to, to, to this actuality. Sure. Uh, how do you see your, your center of excellence in five years? Five years is a long way now oh, in, in FinTech. Yeah. Maybe it's been run by AI at that point. I'm not sure, but uh, no, that, that's just being facetious. We want this knowledge. So we see Mauritius as the perfect place to launch this, right? It's a hub. You positioned yourself successfully as a hub into Africa, uh, and you have all of the traits of making this a very successful hub. In terms of reach, we would like to see the center of excellence reach all 55 states in Africa, right? If we can make an impact on marginalized communities in Africa, uh, awareness training, if we can make an impact on how policy makers look at technology and digital transformation, then I think we would have, we would have achieved our goals. It is, it is not a business, it is not a business making uh, uh, venture, it is certainly as its core, I'm, I'm a teacher by, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, by birth almost, but at its core is this idea to, trans to transpose knowledge as much as possible. So I think we want to grow it. We need lots of partnerships in order to grow it, but we want to spread our tentacles all over Africa in terms of spreading this message. So it's uh, like a bridge? Yes, like a bridge. 52, 52 bridges? Yes. Will it? It's a big task. It is. 55 countries, 55 it, ecosystems? It is. I'm coming, John claude I'm coming to the end of my formal career. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, the beginning of a new career. And the career of giving back more than I have before. Let, let me take this point. Is it very important for you to give back? Always. So I come from a tradition in South Africa of activism, and giving back is really important. Uh, and uh, a lot of the stuff I do is, is based on that philosophy of giving back, which is how our country achieved its freedom. So it's very, very important to give back, certainly. Dr. Kiru, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Claude.